book two chapter one part one of love among the artists by george bernard shaw this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one part one one evening the concert room in st james's hall was crowded with people waiting to hear the first public performance of a work by mr owen jack entitled prometheus unbound it wanted but a minute to eight o'clock the stalls were filling rapidly the choristers were already in their seats and there was a din of tuning from the band not far from the orchestra sat mr john hoskin with a solemn air of being prepared for the worst and carefully finished at the tie gloves and hair next him was his wife in a venetian dress of garnet-coloured plush her black hair was gathered upon her neck by a knot of deep sea green and her dark eyes peered through lenses framed in massive gold on the foremost side bench still nearer to the orchestra was a young lady with a beautiful and intelligent face she was more delicately shaped than mrs hoskin and was dressed in white her neighbours pointed her out to one another as a sizimplica but she was now mrs adrian herbert her husband was with her and his regular features seemed no less refined and more thoughtful than those of his wife mrs hoskin looked at him earnestly for some time then she turned as though to look at her husband but she checked herself in this movement and directed her attention to the entry of manlius i have counted the band whispered hoskin and it's eighty-five strong they can't give them much less than seven and sixpence apiece for the night which makes thirty-two pounds all but half a crown without counting the singers nonsense said mary after looking round apprehensively to see whether her husband's remark had been overheard five pounds apiece would be nearer the hush the music had just begun and hoskin had to confine his repudiation of mary's estimate to an emphatic shake of the head the overture anxiously conducted by manlius who was very nervous lasted nearly half an hour when it was over there was silence for some moments then faint applause then sounds of disapproval then sufficient applause to overpower these and finally a buzz of conversation a popular baritone singer looking very uncomfortable rose to carry on his part of a dialogue between prometheus and the earth which was the next number of the work the chorus singers also rose and fixed their eyes stolidly but desperately on the conductor who hardly ventured to look at them the dialogue commenced but the attention of the audience was presently diverted from it by the appearance of jack himself who was seen to cross the room with an angry countenance and go out the conclusion of the dialogue was followed by an unbroken silence in the midst of which the popular baritone sat down with an air of relief i find that the music is beginning to grow upon me said mrs hoskin do you said hoskin i wish it would grow quicker i'm only joking he added seeing that she was disappointed it's splendid i wish i knew enough about it to like it but i can see that it has the real classical style when those brass things come in it's magnificent two eminent songstresses now came forward as asia and panthea and the audience prepared themselves for the relief of a pretty duet but asia and panthea sang as strangely as prometheus in spite of which they gained some slow uncertain grudging applause the race of the hours which followed was of great length progressing from a lugubrious midnight hour in e flat minor to a sunrise in a major and culminating with a jubilant clangour of orchestra and chorus which astounded the audience and elicited a partly hysterical mixture of hand-clapping and protesting hisses how stupid these people are exclaimed mrs adrian herbert what imbecility they do not know that it is good music heaven i must confess that to my ear there is not a note of music in it said adrian is it possible said aurelie but it is superb splendid it is ear-splitting said adrian your ears are hardier than mine perhaps i hope we shall hear some melody in the next part by way of variety without doubt we shall it is a work full of melody herbert was confirmed in his opinion by the final number entitled antiphony of the earth and moon which was listened to in respectful bewilderment by the audience and executed with symptoms of exhaustion by the chorus by george said hoskin joining heartily in some applause which began in the cheaper seats that sounded stupendous i'd like to hear it again 
the clapping though not enthusiastic was now general all being good-naturedly willing that the composer should be called forward in acknowledgment of his efforts if not of his success jack who had returned to hear the race of the hours again arose and those who knew him clapped more loudly thinking that he was on his way to the orchestra it proved that he was on his way to the door for he went out as ungraciously as before how disappointing said mary he is so hasty serves them right said hoskin i like his pluck and you may take my word for it mary that is a sterling solid piece of music it reminds me of the pacific railroad of course it is even you can see that said mary who did not quite see it herself it is mere professional jealousy that prevents the people here from applauding properly they are all musicians of some kind or another they are going to give us ten minutes law before they begin again let us take a walk round and find what nanny thinks meanwhile aurelie was excited and almost in tears mr phipson had just come up to them shaking his head sadly as i feared he said as i feared it is a shame she said indignantly a shame unworthy of the english people of what use is it to write music for such a world it is far above their heads said phipson i told him so and their insolence is far beneath his feet said aurelie oh it is a scene to plunge an artist in despair it does not plunge me into despair said adrian with quiet conviction the work has failed and i venture to say that it deserved to fail it is unworthy of you to say so exclaimed aurelie passionately throwing herself back in her seat and turning away from him deserved is perhaps a hard word under the circumstances mr herbert said phipson the work is a very remarkable one and far beyond the comprehension of the public jack has been much too bold even our audiences will not listen with patience to movements of such length and complication i greatly regret what has happened for the people who are attracted by our concerts are representative of the highest musical culture in england a work which fails here from its abstruseness has not the ghost of a chance of success elsewhere ah here is mary some introductions followed hoskins shook adrian's hand cordially and made a low bow to aurelie whom he stole an occasional glance at but did not at first venture to address aurelie looked at mary's dress with wonder i am greatly annoyed by the way mr jack has been treated said mary an audience of working people could not be more insensible to his genius than the people here have shown themselves to-night my wife is quite angry with me because i too am insensible to the beauties of mr jack's composition said herbert you always were said mary mr hoskin is delighted with prometheus is mr hoskin musical more so than you it appears since he can appreciate mr jack phipson then struck in on the merits of the music and he mary and adrian being old friends fell into conversation together to the exclusion of the husband and wife so recently added to their circle hoskin under these circumstances felt bound to entertain aurelie i consider that we have had a most enjoyable evening he said i think there can be no doubt that jack's music is first-rate of its kind ah monsieur jacques's music you find it good very good indeed said hoskin speaking loudly as if to a deaf person he added rashly you are right monsieur said aurelie speaking rapidly in french but it seems to me that there is something unworthy infamous in the icy stupidity of these people here of what use is it to compose great works when one is but held in contempt because of them it is necessary to be a traitor here in order to have success commerce is the ruin of england it renders the people quite anti-artistic je ne puis vous comprendre murmured hoskin the fact is he added more boldly i only dropped a french word to help you out a little but you mustn't take advantage of that to talk to me out of my native language i can speak french pretty well but i never could understand other people speaking it ah said aurelie who listened to his english with strained attention you understand me not very good it is like me with english but in this moment i make much progress i have lesson every day from m herbert you speak very well je vous parle très bien tout à fait comme un anglais je ne saurais i mean i should not know from your speaking that you were a foreigner une 
étrangère vraiment cried aurélie greatly pleased vraiment said hoskyn nodding emphatically it is strange there is only a few months since i know not a word of the english you see you knew the universal language before comment la langue universelle i mean music music he repeated seeing her still bewildered ah yes said aurélie her puzzled expression vanishing you call music the universal language it is true you say very good it must be easy to learn anything after learning music music is so desperately hard i am sure learning it must make people spiritual you know yes yes you observe very justly monsieur i am quite of your advice understand you parfaitement mon wang said hoskyn confidently here mary interrupted the conversation by warning her husband that it was time to return to their places as they did so she said you must excuse me for abandoning you to the szymplica john i suppose you could not say a word to one another why not she's a very nice woman and we got on together splendidly i always do manage to hit it off with foreigners however it was easy enough in her case for she could speak broken english and couldn't understand it whereas i could speak french but couldn't understand the way she talked it she's evidently not a frenchwoman so she spoke to me in english i answered her in french and we talked as easily as i talked to you meanwhile adrian could not refrain from commenting on mary's choice i wonder why she married that man he said to aurelie i cannot believe that she would stoop to marry for money and yet seeing what he is it is hard to believe that she loves him but why said aurelie he is a little commercial but all the english are so and he is a man of intelligence he has very choice ideas you think so aurelie certainly he has spoken very well to me i assure you he has a very fine perception of music it is difficult to understand him because he does not speak french as well as i speak english but it is evident that he has reflected much as for her she is fortunate to have so good a husband what an absurd dress she wears in any other part of the world she would be mocked at as a madwoman your scientific mademoiselle sutherland is in my opinion no great things adrian looked at his wife with surprise and with some displeasure but the music recommenced just then and the conversation dropped some compositions of mendelssohn were played and these he applauded emphatically whilst she sat silent with averted face when the concert was over they saw the hoskins drive away in a neat carriage and herbert who had never in his bachelor days envied any man the possession of such a luxury felt sorry that he had to hire a hansom for his wife's accommodation adrian had not yet found a suitable permanent residence they lived on the first floor of a house in the kensington road aurelie who had always left domestic matters to her mother knew little about housekeeping and could not be induced to take an interest in house hunting the landlady at kensington road supplied them with food and adrian paid a heavy bill every week aurelie exclaiming that the amount was unheard of and the woman wicked but not taking any steps to introduce a more economical system they reached their lodging at a quarter before twelve and adrian when aurelie had gone upstairs turned out the gas and chained the door knowing that the rest of the household were in bed as he followed her up he heard the pianoforte and entering the room saw her seated at it she did not look round at him but continued playing with her face turned slightly upward and to one side an attitude habitual to her in her musical moments he moved uneasily about the room for some time put aside his overcoat turned down a jet of gas that flared and rearranged some trifles on the mantelpiece then he said is it not rather late for the pianoforte aurelie it is twelve o'clock and the people of the house must be asleep aurelie started as if awakened shrugged her shoulders closed the instrument softly and went to an easy chair in which she sat down wearily herbert was dissatisfied with himself for interrupting her and angry with her for being the cause of his dissatisfaction nevertheless looking at her as she reclined in the chair and seemed again to have forgotten his existence he became enamoured my darling eh she said waking again qu'est ce que c'est it has turned rather cold to-night is it wise to sit in that thin dress when there is no fire i do not know shall i get you a shawl it does not matter i am not cold she spoke as if his solicitude only disturbed her 
orley he said after a pause i heard to-night that my mother has returned to town no answer orley he repeated petulantly are you listening to me yes i listen but she did not look at him i said that my mother was in town i think we had better call on her doubtless you will call on her if it pleases you to do so is she not your mother but you will come with me orley will you not never never not to oblige me orley it is not the same thing to oblige you as to oblige your mother i am not married to your mother herbert winced that is a very harsh speech to english ears he said i do not speak in english i speak the language of my heart your mother has insulted me and you were wrong to ask me to go to her my mother has never offended you and yet i sent her away because you did not like her and because it is not the english custom that she should continue with me i know you did not marry her and i do not reproach you with harshness because she is separated from me i will have the like freedom for myself orley cried herbert who had been staring during most of her speech you are most unjust have i ever failed in courtesy towards your mother did i ever utter a word expressive of dislike to her you were towards her as you were towards all the world you were very kind i do not say otherwise in what way can my mother have insulted you you have never spoken to her and since a month before our wedding she has been in scotland where she went lest i should speak to her no doubt why did she not speak to me when i last met her she knew well that i was betrothed to you she is proud perhaps well be it so i also am proud i am an artist and queens have given me their hands frankly your mother holds that an english lady is above all queens i hold that an artist is above all ladies we can live without one another as we have done hitherto i do not seek to hinder you from going to her but i will not go you mistake my mother's motive altogether she is not proud in that way she was angry because i did not allow her to choose a wife for me well she is angry still no doubt of what use is it to anger her further she has too much sense to persist in protesting against what is irrevocable you need not fear a cold welcome orley i will make sure before i allow you to go that you shall be properly received i pray you adrian annoy me no more about your mother i do not know her i will not know her it is her own choice and she must abide by it can you not go to her without me why should i go to her without you said adrian distressed your love is far more precious to me than hers you know how little tenderness there is between her and me but family feuds are very objectionable they are always in bad taste and often lead to serious consequences i wish you would for this once sacrifice your personal inclination and help me to avert a permanent estrangement ah yes exclaimed orley rising indignantly you will sacrifice my honour to the conventions of your world it is an exaggeration to speak of such a trifle as affecting your honour however i will say no more i would do much greater things for you than this that you will not do for me orley but then i love you i do not want you to love me said orley turning towards the door with a shrug go and love somebody else love madame hoskyn and tell her how badly your wife uses you herbert made a step after her orley he said if i submit to this treatment from you i shall be the most infatuated slave in england i cannot help that and i do not like you when you are a slave it grows late are you going to bed already already my god it is half an hour after midnight you are going mad i think i think i am orally tell me the truth honestly now i cannot bear to discover it by the slow torture of watching you grow colder to me do you no longer love me perhaps she said indifferently i do not love you to-night that is certain you have been very tiresome and she left the room without looking at him for some moments after her departure he remained motionless then he set his lips together went to a bureau and took some money from it put on his hat and overcoat and took a sheet of paper from his desk but after dipping a pen in the ink several times he cast it aside without writing anything as he did so he saw on the mantelpiece a little brooch which orley often wore at her throat he took this up and was about to put it into his pocket when giving way to a sudden impulse he
he dashed it violently on the hearthstone he then extinguished the light and went out when he had descended one stair he heard a door above open and a light footfall on the landing above he stopped and held his breath end of book two chapter one part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine